Hello, my name is Håkon and welcome back to my channel where today I'm going to talk about this book. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Dao De Qing so much. I'm going to talk about this particular version of it and, and give my little review of it. Um, I will get back to talking more about Lao Tzu's Dao De Jing in future videos because I think it's quite an interesting book. Uh, but at today I'm going to talk about this translation and this particular volume of it. So I used to, I had a, a book of the Dao De Jing uh, a long time ago, actually, I'll just, if you excuse me, two seconds. So uh, my first entry into the world of Taoism was the Tao of Pu, of course, just like many others. This is... Um, Perhaps uh, one that many have read, uh, and of course lots of people would have read this without reading the Tao Te Ching. Uh, and it does have some really good points in it, and a lot of, of things that can actually help you uh, get through life, I suppose, in a nice and comfortable way. Uh, being more humble, being more helpful, being etc, etc. There are lots of positive uh, things about it um, that you can learn from it. And after I read this, I read a version of the Tao Te Ching, uh, which I quite liked, actually. And I'm not sure if I still have it. And if I do, I don't know where it is. Uh, you see, after I moved from Norway, a lot of my... I had to leave lots of my books behind. Oh, yeah, I know. Um, but I, I thought I would have brought that with me, just like this one. But I can't find it. So I don't know where it is at the moment. It may be in the loft still. So, I wanted to read the Tao Te Ching again, um, and of course, almost 30 years later, that does make a difference to how you perceive things. Well, it's not quite 30, but 27 years later. Um, and I wondered, what version do I buy? Because back 27 years ago, when I wanted to buy the Tao Te Ching, I went to the bookshop, or one of the bookshops, there would only be a few, I mean, there would be two really good ones in, in Bergen that would have several, more than one version. And I looked at the versions they had, and I picked the one I liked the best. Simple, yes? Um, but today, if you want to buy the Dao Te Ching, you go online, and there are literally hundreds of versions, and most of them, presumably, are rubbish as well. Um, I'm sorry, I just have to say that, because I know for a fact that many of the versions you get are either just uh, copying the text of the earliest translations that are public domain, or they take the earliest translations that are public domain and they just alter them a little bit. And many of the uh, translations of the Tao Te Ching are indeed just based on a previous translation, so that means it's a reinterpreting of a reinterpretation, which doesn't sound like a very good idea when you think about it. Um, so I wanted to get a proper translation, and uh, I looked at forums, I looked at reviews on Amazon, I did the look inside feature on Amazon as well, quite a bit. And in the end, I ended up on this one, which is by, oops, I'm hiding the name there, Derek Lin. Um, and this is a print-on-demand book, I can tell by the quality of it. Um, so directly, the thing, the idea, the reason I bought this one uh, particularly was that it's meant to be a precise, literal translation of the original. And it is unusually as well written by somebody who is bilingual. So uh, somebody who is a native English speaker and a native Chinese speaker, both. Um, whereas most other translations are written by someone who's one or the other, um, or by somebody else who's an, an English native English speaker who's just copied someone else and made their own embellishments based on their own interpretations, etc. See, it's quite a minefield, as you can you can probably tell. Um, so this is meant to be a literal translation, as literal as possible, uh, by somebody who knows English and Chinese really well, and as, as well as knowing classical Chinese. And um, so, so there are some really, really good things about this because of that, um, but there are also some bad things about it. So, um, what can I say about this? Okay, so... Um, 
in the introduction to this book, Derek does point out that one of the problems with a, a translation that isn't literal, uh, just to go through that first, is that it inevitably is a reinterpretation of the original text. If you don't translate something as literal as possible, you have to interpret it, and then you have to write down that interpretation, and that is the new text. Uh, that's one thing that can happen. Um, some people also, uh, this the original, the Tao Te Ching, is a poem. It is actually full of poetic devices, um, and one thing that can be quite tempting, and lots of, some people do this, is that they write a translation in poetry as well. And, and of course, in order to get a parallel for Chinese um, tone contrast, for instance, um, uh, an English poet translator might sort of think, oh yeah, I'll, I'll, the, the equivalent really isn't, we don't really do that in, in English, so uh, the equivalent would be things like, um, uh, oh, um, lost, lost the word now. Uh, I've got a mind blank on that word, which is one of my favorite poetic devices. Um, what do you call it when... <laughs> okay, serious mind blank. So what do you call it when you have two words starting with the same consonant, a group of consonants, but you have two different vowels? It's... Oh... It is not possible. How can I forget this? Uh, uh, I need more tea, probably, uh, or more water. It's early in the morning here. Uh, I just woke up. That's not that's not a good excuse. I'll have to look it up now because this is going to be killing me. This is killing me. And I do it all the time, and I write as well. I love it. I love. Um, Alliteration, yes. <laughs> oh, got there in the end, didn't we? Yes, alliteration, yes. Alliteration when you have... Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to do this again. Okay. Right, so <laughs> let's try this again. So uh, many translators, they um, try to make a poetic um, translation. And, and of course, we don't have the same poetic devices in uh, English as we do in classical Chinese. Of course, Chinese you, is a tonal language um, uh, in the sense that tones actually change the meaning and you can have tone contrasts um, in a completely different way to what you would in English. Um, so that when you translate, you want to create that sense of something being poetic and the original is using tones uh, in English, you might then use something like uh, like rhymes or alliteration, for instance, um, or assonances, uh, things like that. Uh, and also you can use the rhythm, of course, because the, uh, the closest sort of uh, one to one, not really one to one. Uh, if you want to compare poetry that uses tone contrast to English poetry, the main sort of uh, feature that actually fills in the same function is the meter, of course, for the English um, poetry. So you have the iambic meter usually when every other syllable is stressed. So that kind of thing. Um, whereas in the tone uh, language, tonal language like, like Chinese, you could actually have a pattern of the tonal change that fills the same kind of function. So when uh, people translate it who are poets, who want to sort of uh, try to convey the original s uh, sense of poeticness, um, then of course one of the ways they would do this is to, to add their own poetic spin on it in based on the poetic devices of English. Um, and this also has problems because if you do that, you have to deviate more from the literal meaning of the words. And so again, you are interpreting, but then you are also doing something that uh, poetry is really good at, and that is uh, it expresses something beyond the words because that is the whole point 
of poetry, and I'll probably make a video about that too someday. Uh, in essence, poetry is taking words with literal meanings, but because it is in a poetic context and you change the way those words are normally used and put together, they can then express more than the literal meaning because it draws attention to the literal meaning and how it is deviated from in the text. Um, and this would also be true of the original Tao Te Ching and how do you translate that? You can't really translate that. Um, and so this is one of the problems with a literal translation is that it actually misses that aspect of the original completely. Uh, and so a good literal translation requires a lot of annotations where you explain not just um, you have a word, of course, you try to get the best sort of one-to-one -one translation uh, between the original and the English. But uh, in addition to that, you also have to explain every single double meaning. You have to explain every time the this particular way of expressing something is because of a poetic device and what does that poetic device express. Uh, you also have to take into account idioms, aphorisms, sayings, and of course these would be the sayings and aphorisms of thousands of years ago uh, in classical Chinese. Um, and you have to explain every single metaphor as well uh, in as much detail as is needed for us to get the same understanding of it as the original readers would have had when the book was new. Now, is, does this sound like an easy task? <laughs> it doesn't. And uh, what I do not like about Derek Lynn's uh, version is that he, most of the time, he actually doesn't do any of those things in his notes. Uh, a few times he does actually explain rather well a few um, uh, interesting uh, ways of uh, expressing something in a classical Chinese that you wouldn't understand just by reading the literal words. But when you read his explanation, it makes sense. Uh, like he's talking about straw dogs, for instance, at one point, and this has to do with some kind of religious ritual. Um, and a few other words that uh, would get uh, like uh, left and right, for instance, uh, which also has different connotations in classical Chinese than it does in, um, in European languages. Of course, in, in European languages, um, we have... When we're contrasting left and right, you often have left as being the negative and right as being the positive, and in Chinese it's the other way around. Uh, so things like this need explaining, and some of those things have been explained in the text, but not all of them. Um, so um, a lot of the notes are instead dedicated to explaining the meaning of the text as it pertains to an understanding of the Tao. So of course it's trying to explain Taoism through the text with explanations in the notes, um, which is most of the time fine, but the problem I have with that is that the entire point of a literal translation is to avoid interpretation, but then if you try explaining it um, to the reader, you are then putting your own interpretations into the notes rather than into the text, which still is perhaps better because you still, as a reader, have the text to fall back on and you can say, hang on, hang on a minute, I see what you're writing there in your explanation, but I don't agree with that, that doesn't really match up with what I'm reading. Uh, so you do have that option, so it is still in some ways better, but um, I feel it's a bit disingenuous uh, towards the reader as well that he does that in the notes. Um, and another thing that is a little bit weird as well, and of course, uh, as I've been saying now, a lot of the time the notes don't actually explain what they need to, which is um, explaining the reasons for the literal language being stilted and sometimes a little bit cryptic. Um, but in addition to that, um, there are a few places in the book where he actually goes off on what I would call a tangent. And it seems like Derek Lynn has a, his own personal interpretation of 
of the DAO and that doesn't actually match with anything it says in, in Lao Tzu's book or uh, with the world or the real world in general uh, I'll just read that for you now just to see if you uh, see what I mean so this is from one of the notes to chapter 21 and it says here Perhaps the answer to one of the mysteries above is that we are not life forms that have become self-aware. Perhaps it is the other way around. We are entities of pure consciousness that have learned how to manifest in the physical universe through the workings of life. And that is what we in... Uh, in, in, in my part, in my worldview, we call that absolute nonsense. Um, there's absolutely nothing in the text that, that leads to that interpretation. That is purely something that's a figment of Derek Lynn's own imagination. And, um, and it's got nothing to do with everything. It actually goes against a lot of the stuff that it says in the text and a lot of the other things that he's been explaining in the notes. Um, so that is just completely off kilter. Um, but generally, the notes are good, uh, although I would have liked them to be more to do with the text, because in the literal text, you need all those explanations for every single metaphor, double meaning, um, poetic device, etc., etc., idioms. Um, and if not, if you don't get those, then you can't read the text literally, because sometimes it just seems a bit weird. Um, uh, let's see, I can't see if I can find something that's really... Uh, strange without yeah I should have bookmarked the place there because there are some places where if you just read the text it just doesn't make any sense until you yeah anyway um, that's not so important just take my word for it there are places in the text that are if you read the text literally it doesn't make any sense um, and, and this is, of course, another problem with the literal translation. Would it have read as nonsensical in Chinese, is my question. And I don't think it would have done. So um, in that case, it's a bad translation, even though it is literal. Um, so, yeah. But still, we're sort of getting into that area. What is literal, really? Um, what else was there I wanted to say about this now? Um, are there better translations out there? Um, I'm sure there is actually. I'm quite sure that is there are better ways to translate this than this. I mean, it is it is not a bad translation. If you ignore the notes that you don't need to understand the text, um, it is actually quite good. I would say. Um, I am still going to try to find more versions of the Tao Te Ching to to read because. I think that the best way to understand the text, the original text, if you don't read Chinese um, and you don't read classical Chinese, is probably to read several versions, uh, which means you end up reading several interpretations of it. But then the sum of those versions, uh, the similarities and the differences between them, all, all those things seen together, might bring you gradually closer and closer to the essence of the original text and and also it might help you in your understanding of it. Um, you probably don't need the whole text to understand the meaning of the Tao necessarily, but the thing is that um, if you read the wrong text in the wrong way with the wrong notes, you might actually get the wrong understanding of it, or you might understanding what actually go away from what it's supposed to be of it. And, um, and, and so, yeah, it is really tricky, especially with something that is so um, ineffable, I should say, as the Tao, um, which is what a lot of the book is about, the ineffab ineffability of the Tao. Um, and something that is so hard to explain as well, because even with um, the Tao Te Ching is supposed to be an explanation of the Tao. Uh, it is, um, so the story goes, uh, Lao Tzu's summaries of books in the library he was librarian of from the ancients, so that is people thousands of years before uh, Lao Tzu, uh, and it's summaries of those of the essence of what they say about the Tao, that he sort of put down into this into this book. So, yeah, 
Um, so I still think this might be worth reading, but I am going to get some other versions and compare them. And um, um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do that. So anyway, it's a very interesting book. Um, I mean, the Tao Te Ching is, uh, and it's uh, still, even though um, Derek Lynn goes off on a few weird tangents in this one, it's still a lot of the notes are highly useful in understanding the text. And he also has a few points that uh, other interpreters uh, and translators of the text don't actually have. And also he clears up a few uh, potential misunderstandings that are quite common when it comes to the Tao as well. Um, so overall, I would say it is rather good, but uh, it does have its shortcomings. Uh, and one of them is also, um, one of its virtues is it's literal, and one of its shortcomings comings is that it's literal. Both can be true at the same time, fittingly, because it has to do with the Tao. So there we go. Um, so that's all I wanted to talk about today, and uh, I hope that wasn't too much rambling, but I just wanted to get that off my chest, uh, because uh, especially the uh, his uh, Derek Lynn's personal notes about us being beings of pure consciousness just sort of jarred me so much when I was reading it, I just had to get that off my chest. Okay, um, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time in a video about, I don't know, so please like, share, comment, subscribe, join me on Patreon. Goodbye for now. Bye-bye.